good afternoon or good evening, good morning, as it may be. It's my great pleasure to welcome you at this Qatar Symposium. My name is Bert Hoffman. I'm the chair of epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. The Qatar Symposium is the sixth in a series, as I said, but the Qatar lecture has been held since 1912. Um, it is under the bequest of John Clarence Cutter, a graduate of Harvard Medical School, and it is the oldest lecture series uh, in epidemiology and preventive medicine worldwide. It is, has been since 1912 given um, under the auspices of the Department of Epidemiology of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, as it's called now. Uh, the symposium series is a bit less old. This is our sixth um, annual event. We had a symposium devoted to uh, big data. Last year, we had epidemiology and racism, and today is epidemiology and causes. And given, I think, that one of the uh, big uses of epidemiology is not only finding causes, but studying uh, causal relationships, I think it is, a, is apt to, uh, to, to discuss this. And we have three great speakers this afternoon, and I will introduce George Davy Smith Maria Glemmer and Miguel Hernan uh, just before they start to speak. First speaker then is uh, George Davy Smith. He is the professor of clinical epidemiology at the University of Bristol. Uh, he is also an honorary professor in public health uh, and a visiting professor at the London School of Hygiene. Um, he is the director of the integrative uh, epidemiology unit of the Medical Research Council uh, at the University of, of uh, Bristol. And George, it is wonderful to have you. You will speak about um, ubiquitous causes. Can they be identified? Dr. George Davy Smith. Right. Yeah, I'm just sharing my screen. Can I, uh, is that visible? Yes, it is. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks so much for the uh, invite. Uh, it's a shame that it's not uh, in person, as I am in, I'm in Bristol. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, ubiquitous causes. I'm going to start off by talking about an analogous situation um, in the field of genetic epidemiology. And this is a, a story from Nature 14 years ago about the case of missing heritability. So, genome wide association studies were possible from 2000 and six, and started to look for common genetic variants related to diseases and traits like height and body mass index, etc. But the first large scale genome wide association studies only identified SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, explaining about 5% of the heritability that we knew from twin studies. And so a whole variety of hypotheses were put, put out about what this missing heritability, this gap between what we knew in principle uh, existed and what could be demonstrated. And there were some suggestions that the heritability estimates were wrong, we needed to start again, that epigenetic inheritance was uh, really important, that epistasis and gene environment interaction had been underestimated, et cetera. But over the years and up to the beginning of this year, the heritability that can be explained now by actually genotyped variants is close to the expected heritability. And the answers from the list were that you know, there are few common variants of moderate to large effect, huge number of tiny effect variants covering about 20% of the genome, and there's some rare variants of varying effect sizes. But that sort of gap uh, has been closed. So the case of the missing heritability has been solved, but the case but the missing environment, I think, is still open and needs investigating. And one of the important sources on the case of the missing, the case of the missing environment, I think, is Richard Dahl and Richard Pito's groundbreaking 1981 report on the causes of cancer. They put together data on the standard epidemiological ways of knowing that things could be prevented, which is that there's time trends, they've gone up. There's big geographical differences. Migrant studies show that people 
when they move might get the risk of the place they go to. And there are some identified causes. And they tried to quantify these for the differences in geography. They looked at um, large cancer registries, which were known to be reasonably valid, and looked across the world for, place, for the largest sort of difference between a, a, a bona fide cancer registry uh, that had high rates and one that had low rates uh, of the disease. And for many of these, there was just huge ratios between the risk and the highest and lowest uh, rate uh, places. And they tied this in with the time trend and time trends and migrant study data. They discussed then the avoidability of cancer, that there was this uh, disjunction between what was pre preventable in principle what you estimated could be preventable from those sorts of data and what was actually preventable in practice through what was known. They also discussed what was preventable by acceptable uh, means, uh, what, what sorts of means to prevent uh, cancer uh, would populations uh, adopt. And they came up with estimates of about 75 to 80% of the, of the cases of cancer in a high income country in the US in both sexes might have been avoidable. In terms of uh, what was acceptable. They discussed um, if, if, if rules were given about changing sexual behaviour and reproductive behaviour to reduce cancer in many decades forward, it was unlikely that this would be widely adopted. But you could intervene to break the link between the upstream de determinants uh, and um, the outcome by preventing infection, stimulating, inhibiting hormonal secretion, etc. This is why it was important to understand how much could be prevented and to start having some ideas of the mechanisms that link the two. Famously, they came up with estimates uh, of what they thought were likely to be the contributions um, to this preventable component. Tobacco, of course, was the known cause um, that was very extremely well established and their best estimate was it explained about 30% of cancer deaths they thought diet would, would fill much of the missing gap and gave a range of acceptable estimates between 10 and 70%. They gave infection uh, an estimate of 10%, but with no upper bounds on what, uh, what it might be. And they discussed how conventional ways of seeing whether something was in, could be infectious. I mean, did nurses caring for patients, did they get the disease, which of course they didn't do in cancer. Uh, might not apply if the if the infections were cofactors with uh, other fact with other uh, risk factors. For the future role of epidemiology, they discussed the black box strategy, which they thought had yielded the most important findings thus far. Which, of course, was the case because the most important findings thus far were on uh, were on smoking and uh, lung cancer. They discussed a mechanistic strategy, and that the mechanistic strategy then, when they were writing, was largely uh, mutagenicity tests to see whether uh, elements in the in the environment uh, would lead to mutations in these in these laboratory mutagen mutagenicity uh, tests. That was the the mechanistic strategy they discussed. They said both approaches are needed, but it's perhaps clear from this report where our sympathies lie, which was with the block black box strategy and they advocated a blood bank and perhaps additional biological samples being collected backed prospective study of at least a few hundred thousand healthy people should be initiated and that was of course way ahead of its time i'm now a participant in two uh, studies which are over half a million people uh, i get included uh, twice in some of these genome-wide association studies but i don't think that's going to distort the results too much um, and they suggested that the aliquots of samples could be sold off to research workers, uh, which was uh, was an idea that I don't think has been really uh, taken forward in, in such a in, uh, in such a straightforward way. At the same time, they published a paper uh, in Nature entitled "Can Dietary Beta Carotene Materially Reduce Human Cancer Rates," which gave an extremely balanced uh, review of the evidence from the laboratory uh, studies, um, as well as epidemiological data. And they thought that it was the evidence was uh, enough that it was worth launching randomized controlled trials. They were very clear that randomized controlled trials were required uh, of um, interventions which might produce small benefits, but you need to test uh, to, um, to make sure that they are effective and don't produce uh, harm. But that's following up there um, privileging of diet uh, as the category that was going to become filled. Uh, 
And of course, many studies were set up um, after the report came out. They did discuss uh, the fact that uh, many changes in cancer in populations that occurred without us understanding why, uh, the most dramatic one really being the decline in gastric cancer in wealthy countries from the beginning of the 20th century on, what's been called, what was called, uh, you know, the epidemiology of an unplanned triumph. Um, it wasn't known why this was occurring at the time. So uh, in 2022, uh, Paul Brennan and I um, did a, a very rough uh, sort of updating of these types uh, of estimates, looking between um, uh, cancer registries uh, across five continents to get um, the bottom sort of 5% uh, um, um, of, of cancer registries that had the bottom 5% rates and the top 5% rates and looking between uh, them and got the same um, very large um, differences that were seen in uh, 1981. Um, even, even though, of course, the makeup of cancers had uh, changed really quite markedly with you know, large increases in, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, increases in testicular cancer, um, et cetera, and declines in stomach cancer and, uh, and some others. But the, the basic, uh, in principle, preventable uh, component uh, rem proportion remained the same, but remained very substantial. When looking at um, known causes, uh, we, this is, these are data taken from Brown et al, uh, from the UK data in 2015, applied to 2015, looking at the population attributable fraction from different known causes. And in the UK population, um, you know, smoking had fallen to about 15% because smoking has declined. Amongst ever smokers, the proportion was uh, you know, over 30%. But in never smokers, the proportion which can be explained by any known uh, causes is, is low. So this, this sort of missing environment component uh, exists in 2022. And a very recent umbrella review of the evidence associating uh, diet and cancer risk at 11 anatomical uh, sites, um, uh, which is uh, highly recommended, you know, comes to the conclusion that the relatively small proportion can actually be explained by at a, at a sort of acceptable level, level of evidence uh, relating uh, dietary factors uh, to cancer. So that um, gap um, remains, remains large. And uh, Paul and I didn't uh, sort of speculate um, on, the, on which components were going to uh, fill it. But the case of the missing environment uh, remains. So one factor that would make detecting uh, environmental contributions to cancer difficult is when they are ubiquitous. So these are the data from the 1950 Dolan, uh, Richard Dolan, uh, Austin Bradford Hill uh, case control study of smoking and carcinoma of the lung. And this is looking at when they say non-smokers, so this is never smokers. So amongst the cases of lung carcinoma cases, only two uh, or 0.3% had never smoked. But then again, amongst the controls, the patients with diseases other than cancer, it was less than 5%. This was a, a habit which most people had tried for a bit. Um, so, you know, I think fits the category of a ubiquitous exposure. So let's do a thought experiment, first suggested by Jeffrey Rose, I think, about uh, smoking and lung cancer. This is Bristol. And let's imagine that a dictator has taken over in Bristol and has decided that everyone has to smoke exactly 20 cigarettes a day from adolescence on. You're given your pack of capstan full strength. The CCTV cameras are on to make sure that you're smoking them down to the butt. You're not trying to get out of, uh, out of it. You're not allowed to go to bed until all 20 have gone. And uh, Bristol would be a good place for that. Uh, the, uh, a nearby city to Bristol is Bath, Jane Austen's uh, centre. You'll, if you see the films, you'll recognise Bath. Uh, let's imagine that in Bath, no one is allowed to smoke at all. So the dictator has arrived in Bath and they're banning smoking. The CCTV cameras are locating anyone who tries to smoke and stopping them. And we follow up for 50 years. Now, obviously, Bath would have vastly more lung cancer than Bristol. But within Bristol, think about how smoking relates to lung cancer risk, because every single person is smoking exactly 20 cigarettes a day. There can't be a relationship between 
uh, smoking and lung cancer risk. So you think within Bristol, what causes one individual rather than another to get lung cancer? So you think, well, you know, maybe genes, but you know, twin studies matched on smoking show there's a very, there's a small, a very, you know, very small genetic contribution to uh, lung cancer risk between uh, twins who smoke equal amounts. So uh, genes don't seem to explain it. One could think maybe occupation, maybe some other environmental exposure, but a likely component uh, would be factors that we might as well just call chance that I'll come on to later. So within one of the populations and within Bath, what explains who gets lung cancer? The same. Between Bristol and Bath, what causes the huge difference in the rate of lung cancer almost entirely, well, would be entirely explained by smoking. So at a population level, an exposure may be responsible for nearly all cases, but again, account for little of the difference in risk between individuals. And between individuals, what can be called chance or luck may be a major factor in who gets disease. So here's a photo of Winnie, who's 100 years old, and um, she's been smoking for 93 years, and she's lighting a, a cigarette from the candles on her 100th birthday cake, and she's declaring that she ain't going to stop today. Now, you could start thinking, well, we should sort of sequence uh, Winnie. Let's find out what, uh, let's ask Winnie what's made her live longer. Well, let's sequence her and find out the genetic contributions to her longevity. But it might be that if we'd rolled the clock back, let's roll the clock back to when Winnie was 60. And when she was 60, the postman comes around at 11 a.m., knocks on her door. Winnie opens the door to get her parcel, but a gust of wind comes in and she coughs and coughs up a metaplastic cell that was heading to become a cancer. Now, if the postman had come at 10.59 or if the postman had come at 11.01, then uh, Winnie wouldn't be around to uh, light a cigarette from, all, from, from her 100th birthday cake. But if we rolled back the clock and changed things for other people, someone, there'd definitely be someone filling Winnie's place. The Winnies will always exist, but it wouldn't be the same person if we, re, if we rerun, rerun history. So there's sort of chance at a sort of biographical level right the way down to chance at, at the molecular level of uh, epimutations, uh, DNA mutations, et cetera that, um, that uh, influence uh, risk. So let's consider an exposure which is like smoking, but unlike smoking, couldn't be reasonably well characterized in terms of current and past duration and heaviness of exposure with a simple questionnaire. With smoking, such data could be gathered, but for many uh, exposures, in particular environmental exposures and behaviors which are difficult to, um, to categorize and um, to ask about, um, they couldn't, those, these sorts of, the quality, this quality of data couldn't be uh, captured. So another example which sort of illustrates the uh, elements of stochasticity when thinking about cancer development are uh, cancers of bilateral organs. So let's consider kidneys here and consider your left and your right kidney. Obviously they have the same germline DNA. And if you eat healthy fruit and veg, then the uh, antioxidants that are circulating circulate to them both. Uh, if you smoke, then similarly, the toxic elements go to them both or drink alcohol. Or if you jog and are um, uh, low uh, body mass, low adiposity, or if you um, are exposed to trichloroethylene, this was actually used as an obstetric uh, anesthetic when I was a medical student. If you're exposed to that, both would get equally exposed. But if one kidney develops cancer in an individual, then the other kidney, which has been perfectly matched on all the exposures we can think of, sensibly think of, as things we could do something about, um, that's perfectly matched on that, only has a small, say 30%, increased risk of developing its own primary tumor as someone in the general population. So you're matching on all the exposures, and it's really a rather small uh, relative risk. I mean, uh, you know, think of trying to draw your um, causal pie for why the left rather than the right kidney got um, developed uh, cancer. So there's, there's clearly a large element of, of stochasticity. And um, uh, sequencing studies uh, which are carried out in, in tumor tissue, cancer tumor tissue, have been incredibly informative. But recent studies which have also uh, sequenced um, surrounding normal uh, tissue have discovered that what appear to be driver mutations are found are quite widespread 
in the normal uh, human uh, tissues. So there's a sort of stochastic, clearly a stochastic element in which of these actually go on to become, uh, to become cancers. So between individual analyses might not be rewarding in populations within which exposures are ubiquitous. So let's think of categories of potentially ubiquitous exposures. They're not mutually exclusive. So infectious agents would be one. There's many uh, everywhere and forever chemicals uh, that are in the environment. There's the climate, there's water, including drinking water, indoor, outdoor air pollution, social stresses, anthropogenic light, obesogenic environment, and you could think of many more. But I'll, uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, consider in infections. So uh, examples of ubiqu ubiquitous infections. Well, one infection which is um, ubiquitous is Epstein-Barr virus infection, of which nearly 100% of the population become infected at some stage of their life, usually in uh, childhood or, or early adulthood. Um, uh, it relates strongly to multiple sclerosis risk, um, indeed with very good characterization of infections. Um, there may be no cases of multiple sclerosis which haven't, uh, haven't been infected. But the age of infection is key in Epstein-Barr virus infection. Later infection is more likely to lead to infectious mononucleosis, but also to multiple sclerosis. And this is uh, a factor sort of very well recognized by the classic infectious disease epidemiologists uh, of the first half of the 20th century, who used to discuss the honeymoon period of infection, which is if you get an infection between sort of age four and 14, uh, in this honeymoon period, you've got, you've got mild or mildest disease. And this is a very good systematic review using much of that historical literature. Uh, which finds that for many infections, uh, uh, this is the case. Of course, not for all infections, but for many infections, it's the case. For yellow fever, for example, if you get it in early childhood, uh, you don't get uh, particularly sick in general. Um, I mean, some people get sick, but very few. But, uh, but you're then protected. But if you don't, if you don't haven't been infected and, um, get, and become primarily infected in adulthood, you get very sick or die, often die. And, and people who move into communities where there is yellow fever, of course, had high mortality rates. So there's, a, an, there's an exposure which basically happens to everyone, but the age at which it happens, which is very difficult, which is difficult to capture, uh, will be key, and other factors like your vitamin D status when you become infected, et cetera, will be key to whether you develop disease. Or think of H. pylori in relation to peptic ulcer and stomach cancer, another infection which is um, you know, essentially 100% of uh, many populations at one time. And you know, peptic ulcer um, showed very clear birth cohort uh, effects. Um, Mervyn Susser and uh, Zena Stein demonstrated this in a beautiful paper uh, 60, um, 60 years ago. Um, now, the, inter the interesting thing here is why was, it, why, was, uh, why was it going up and then coming down? And one possibility is that it was basically that as, as hygiene improved, infection started becoming later in children. And studies in mice suggest that very early infection leads to tolerance where you don't develop a disease. And it's basically later infection um, that is more likely to lead to disease. And then of course, the next stage is that people don't get helicobacter pylori infection at all. And this could explain the African, uh, the Africa enigma of H. pylori. There's maternal infection uh, and inflammation during very specific short stages of pregnancy, when an infection, you know, if, at one stage might lead to German measles and if, lead to you know, rubella, congenital disease from rubella, uh, but a few weeks either side or even a few days either side uh, won't. And there's much circumstantial evidence from season of birth effects, uh, et cetera, that uh, some neurodevelopmental disorders, schizophrenia, autism, spectrum disorder, et cetera, might be, have, have be influenced by maternal infection. But uh, you know, epidemiologically trying to get evidence uh, about uh, infection uh, you know, one day and not 10 days later or before, right the way through pregnancy is extremely difficult. Um, and this, these could have important effects on offspring outcomes, uh, as is shown again in, in rodent studies where injecting IL-6 at very particular stages of the process of infecting the animals has 
uh, detrimental uh, consequences on the neurodevelopment of the offspring and probably uh, multiply to humans too. So how can we investigate uh, ubiquitous exposures? So black box approaches have worked in the past, but the impasse suggests that, that they may not be optimal now, the fact that they're not really filling much of this gap. Large birth cohorts, I think, optimally recruited before conception, that longitudinally investigated infections in parents and their offspring right the way through to adulthood are key. The one we really want to get our ha the handle on what the normal age range of infection is, consequence of infection at uh, different ages, as uh, this, these might influence um, many uh, conditions. Um, ecological studies of cases and population representative samples from low and high incidence communities with environmental sampling, but in addition to getting human tissues where DNA methylation assays, for example, can be very useful in detecting uh, exposure to environmental exposures like arsenic, etc. And mutation signatures have also been used. This is a um, this is a, a nice study which was looking at very high risk esophageal cancer play, uh, places and low incidence places, and it was it, they thought they would find a mutation signature in the high incidence places, which would tell them about an exposure, as you get mutation signatures for smoking, UV light, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they did they didn't find uh, such a signal. And uh, I really like the fact that a newspaper uh, report from um, Mike, Michael Stratton and Paul Brennan, who ran this uh, study, they, you know, they actually in the newspaper saying, we didn't find out what we thought we'd find and we need to get new methods of trying to discover these missing causes of uh, cancer. And you need to work, we need to work with environmental scientists to detect exposures. The technologies they have got uh, now are just truly uh, astounding in terms of what can be measured. And ecology of wild animal populations can inform about threats to, to human health because, of course, they don't choose their behaviours, but they are exposed to environmental uh, phenomena. And uh, human genetic variation can be used to identify environmental causes of disease. This can be the main effect of, of variants. For example, an inflammatory bowel disease um, the, the uh, genetic variants, the germline genetic variants that became top in the genome-wide association studies are, tend to be bacterial sensing and bacterial responding um, variants. I did an epidemiology course with Jeffrey Rose, epidemiology for cl clinicians years ago, and another person on the course was wanting to show that cornflakes, uh, you know, was the cause of inflammatory bowel disease. I think infection, because the genetic data was, would be a much stronger candidate. Vitamin D variants, including rare, rare large effect variants, relate to multiple sclerosis risk. Genetic variant related to smoking more heavily, if you're a smoker, relates to lung cancer. And you can also um, use interactions. This is this genetic variant in front of five, CHRNA5, which leads to you smoking more heavily if you are a smoker. And then you can look at how this variant relates to outcomes, uh, both among smokers and non-smokers, because the variant doesn't really influence whether you're a smoker at all. It just influences how heavily you smoke if you do smoke. And what one would look for is um, a, a qualitative interaction where the variant uh, relates uh, to the disease risk in smokers, but not in uh, never smokers. And this is what is seen with the largest effect uh, interaction that's in the UK Biobank. If you just do a whole scan of all the uh, genes and all the... Um, all the environmental factors, which is in uh, ever smokers, the genetic variant leads to a, a large reduction in uh, lung function, but in never smokers to, uh, to none, and there's a very strong uh, interaction. So these interactions can be used uh, to, to detect uh, um, such exposures. And in the maternal infection case, for example, the, um, if, if you can use an interaction between the, the mother uh, for example, carrying the high-risk variant of the IL-6 receptor genetic variant and, the, you know, the time of pregnancy that, you know, might report um, some a fever or be using paracetamol or whatever, and to see there's an, an interaction there with the genetic variant in the offspring neurodevelopmental um, outcomes. So uh, such interactions, I think, uh, there's, um, have a lot of promise. So in conclusion, I think establishing background knowledge isn't the most trivial element in causal inference. I think the, a hybrid of mechanistic and black box methods has been made available by the extraordinary power of germline genetic and other high dimensional data, like the methylation data you can use, DNA methylation data for exposure characterization. You can show when someone's 60, you can say whether their mother smoked when she was pregnant with them. 
I think we need methods of triangulation of evidence that can incorporate S demands, but also evidence that cannot be meaningfully reduced to such to make advances to fill this gap, the, miss the, the missing gap in, in, for, the, in, for the causes of disease, which we, where we really uh, don't know what is influencing the disease. Uh, identifying ubiquitous exposures can lead to attempting to remove them. For, you could have EBV vaccination, and of course, Moderna have an EBV vaccine now, uh, or mitigate, for example, vitamin D supplementation in childhood for those at high genetic risk of, of multiple sclerosis, or you can intervene on a mediating mechanism. And uh, to me, the data priority is establishing age of infection effects of common infections, and I think uh, these, this, this might fill, these, these might fill uh, some of that gap. And uh, the only further reading I'd suggest is The Causes of Cancer by Dol and Peter, which is a brilliant book. That's my wide uh, copy. I think it's the, about the best epidemiology textbook to advise people to read if they're interested in applied uh, epidemiology uh, 40 years on. And as you can see, they're available uh, secondhand on Amazon. There's only one customer review, but it does say thank you. So uh, there's one, one satisfied customer. And I'd like to thank uh, Paul Brennan and Caroline Relton, who I've discussed these issues with over uh, several years and uh, hope to carry on doing so. Thanks very much. Cool presentation. Thank you very, very much. I, um, I appreciated very much also that you brought up the Epstein-Barr virus and, uh, and multiple sclerosis. Indeed, um, it, uh, it, it published at the beginning of this year, of course, uh, in Science, a paper, uh, first author for those who haven't seen it, of uh, Geta Bonovic. And indeed, there, of course, the uh, cases and controls have approximately the <laughs> same proportion of, um, of ABV. Also, by the way, you're, the, 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 you can go to the causes of cancer in uh, Oxford University Press, but you could also simply go to the Journal of the yeah. National Cancer Institute because yeah. in 1981 yeah. the paper was published. We have the opportunity uh, for a few questions uh, immediately after the talks, and I invite those who are uh, in the audience to ask questions in the Q&A. I have now a few, and George, is it okay uh, to when I read yeah, them yeah. to you? Yeah. Jose, wonderful presentation. Um, and first question, Amel Bezegir, could we say that the fraction of mutagenicity attributable to heredity and uh, environmental exposure uh, are known, respect, and if they are known, what that proportion is? Yeah, uh, no, uh, I, don't think, I don't think we can say that with respect to um, mutagenicity. Um, uh, we can say we, there are very large twin studies uh, of cancer based on Scandinavian and uh, Nordic um, registries, and they um, fractionate the, um, the variance in, or pseudo variance as it is, in the risk of, of, the, of developing cancers into a uh, additive genetic effect. So that's, so that's the, into a genetic effect, but then two environmental components. So one is the shared environmental component, which makes children uh, who are brought up together more similar. So that would, that would make both um, monozygotic and dizygotic twins more similar that, to that shared environment. And then to a non-shared environmental component, um, which um, uh, is not common between, the, between twins. So it's what th things that they have that are, that are different. And I think what's become um, really inc increasingly clear is that, is that lots of studies were set up to try and find out what this non-shared environment was, but I think um, many people uh, now come to the conclusion that much of this non-shared environment is stochastic. This is these, these are sort of stochastic events like early mutations, but also you know stochastic um, life events, and, and are therefore not that helpful um, for thinking about what we can do to present to prevent disease. And I can remember that for lung cancer, the figures are basically twenty something like 20 something percent uh, heritable, about 15% shared environment. And the shared environment is probably, uh, you know, smoking, which, which is, uh, has a genetic contribution. So the, the, much of the genetics is contributed to through contribution to smoking. And then, you know, the majority of the variance is, is, is non-shared. The majority of the variance is like Winnie opening the door when she's, when she's at 11 a.m. Thank you.
just another one other question we may take it when we do a general discussion at the end uh, i say this to the audience when we do a general discussion at the end we may take those up but uh, for for the bilateral organs uh, then kramer asks are there any discernible left uh, left right predominance uh, cis in cancer so i i, I think that i don't think there are oh. And I, I, I think people have left have, have have looked at that, and they've also looked to see whether left-handed people have to see whether there's any sort of sidedness. But uh, but I, I don't think they are. I am doing a systematic review of of bilateral cancers, so I shall I, I don't think it, I'll see if they actually collect sided if they, if they collected sides. But I don't think I don't think there is. One, uh, you know, cosmic rays are suggested as one as one reason. Appar apparently, you know. Uh, this this is could be sort of plausible for one of those sort of stochastic type effects. Thank you. Um, I think what we do now is, and for those who have had questions, we may take them up later. I think we go now, George, to uh, our next speaker. Thank you very much, and we'll see you back in uh, in the general discussion. Great pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Glimmer who is professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at uh, UCSF, University of California in San Francisco, um, director of the PhD program uh, in epidemiology and translational science there, and um, interested very much in Alzheimer's disease, but also particularly in methods uh, in social epidemiology. Uh, Maria, it's wonderful to have you. and. Uh, I invite you to speak about testing causal claims we can do better. Dr. Maria Glimmer. Thank you. Um, all right, you can see my you can see my slides correctly there. Great. All right. Um, it I is. <laughs> I saw your mouth move, Bert. That was good. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to to participate today and uh, to get to talk to you about my my perspective right now on how we can and should be using the tools of causal inference uh, for promoting population health and and addressing health inequalities. And as I was preparing this talk, I realized that my perspective right now is very much influenced by two major population health events that have that have occurred. One, of course, is the COVID pandemic and the extraordinary and, and preventable loss of life and the inequalities that we've witnessed in that pandemic, um, in the pandemic. And the other, which may seem quite separate, but has actually led me in many ways to think about the same set of problems with respect to causal inference. The other is the, uh, now it's been almost a year since the FDA approved a medication to for the prevention and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, much of the body of my talk may seem disconnected from these two pressing issues. Um, but in fact, they, they are really driving my perspective right now. And um, the so with that background, I'm going to tell you my punchline in case uh, they kick me off the, uh, the stage, as it were, before I finish. Um, I'll tell you my, my general take homes here, which is that the, the last um, several decades of causal inference uh, research in epidemiology has been incredibly powerful, incredibly valuable. And a lot of it is focused on better modeling of backdoor paths, i.e. covariate control methods. These approaches are, are extremely valuable. The, the advances have been very important, but they may have diminishing returns um, compared to what we might do if we had alternative approaches. I think the framework of causal inference, there's still opportunities to really take advantage of that and open up richer um, approaches beyond just better covariate control. And those in particular leverage instrumental variable approaches or randomized designs with light touch randomization. Um, I think that the pandemic uh, has really been compelling in the sense that it's, it represents sort of a series of missed opportunities for rigorous evaluation of alternative public health strategies. Um, even though there was true uncertainty, we often didn't use uh, um, randomization approaches to figure out what, what might make a difference. Um, and I think that actually we're in a totally different place than we were even a decade ago, much less uh, 30 or 40 years ago, because the data, um, the data opportunities now are really different. And that means that the causal identification strategies that could work are very, very different and more powerful. So I think 
in the future, we can we can really move beyond what we've done so far using the causal inference tools. Um, all right, so with that background, those are my take home messages that I'm going to get to eventually, uh, but now you know them in case I have to stop. Um, so with that background, the framework for causal inference, which I think is probably familiar to most people who are who are here today, is, is starts with the, the the observation, of course, we all learn association is not the same as causation, but there is, in fact, a connection, uh, statistical association between two variables, some exposure and an outcome Y, maybe due to any of the following or some combination of chance, random, random chance and a finite sample, that the exposure caused the outcome, that the outcome caused the exposure, that there's a confounder that influenced both, or that there's a common consequence of both that you have somehow conditioned or stratified on. This list is really fantastic, incredibly useful. And I have to say, um, I remember that Miguel, uh, who you'll hear from here in a second, was uh, the first person who showed me this list. And I was so excited when he showed this to me. I was so delighted, I nearly fell off my chair because this list was so clarifying um, in terms of the sort of muddiness of a lot of statistical analyses that we've seen. Um, so, so, we can sort of formalize that list a little bit. Um, and, and that is deeply linked to the deseparation rules. But so the deseparation rules really imply testable implications of proposed causal structures. And I won't go through the formalities of the deseparation rules, but the implication is that any particular causal structure that we propose, and here I've got a couple of fairly simple ones that you might think oh, do we think that W is W causes X or X causes W? Um, uh, these, these causal structures have testable implications and we can use the deseparation rules to articulate those, in, those implications and uh, evaluate whether the causal structures are, are plausible or consistent with the observed data. Now, this is most useful uh, when there is strong theory suggesting two or more competing causal stories, and those causal stories have different testable implications um, that we can test against observed data and use to revise our theory. Sometimes there has been a kind of tension between uh, people who approach uh, epidemiologic research with a more theoretical framework and people who are approaching with causal inference tools, but that tension is actually quite misleading. Really, these tools are the causal inference tools are most powerful when you start with some, some theoretical constraints. Um, the directed acyclic graphs that we use so often are non-parametric, but we can go even further if we try to actually parameterize the, the, the graphs and, and write down plausible numbers on a data generating for data generating models. Um, and so DAGs are incredibly useful, but they're really just one especially convenient and powerful way of representing causal models. And we can specify simulations or mechanistic models based on the DAGs and then falsify proposed causal structures. I'm going to talk about a couple of examples here of, of cases where I think this has been quite useful for, for insights. And this is work um, led by Elizabeth Rose Mayetta and um, also work by Sarah Ackley, who's a postdoctoral fellow in my group. And to um, uh, brilliant scientists in Elizabeth Rose's group, uh, Crystal Shaw, who may or may not be a, a PhD as of today. I don't know if she's quite defended yet. And um, Eleanor Hayes Larson, it's a wonderful postdoc. Um, so one example of a, of a case where we used a, a causal inference, sort of causal structure mod, um, guided simulation to test a uh, uh, competing hypothesis was to understand the relationship between cancer and dementia risk. Um, it's been observed in many settings that uh, people who have survived cancer have lower risk of um, dementia than age-matched individuals with no such cancer history. This is very intriguing from a biological perspective and the possibility that the um, biological processes that create vulnerability to neurodegenerative diseases might, uh, might be related to protection from neoplastic and oncogenic processes. But of course, the second you think about this, you think, well, survival bias is another possible explanation. This might be completely spurious and have nothing to do with some shared inverse biology. So um, Elizabeth Rose's group actually did this beautiful simulation in which they showed they're not really plausible numbers that you could put in for survival bias to explain the patterns of association that we see. 
what you could use to explain this, what could, a bias that could explain the association is simply delayed diagnosis of dementia among people with, with uh, cancer history. Um, so that's a quite plausible story, whereas, um, whereas the survival bias story, although it seems at first glance to be appealing, wasn't very uh, convincing. Another uh, example, which I really found was a beautiful study, was, was to evaluate the question of why the racial inequality in stroke changes um, so much during uh, across ages. So Black Americans below ages uh, about 75 have higher incidence rates of stroke than white Americans. However, above age 75, that, uh, that association attenuates and then even flips. And so you can see up here um, in the top graph, the, the black line here, these are actual numbers from the regards cohort of major national cohort showing uh, racial inequality that begins with higher stroke rates among uh, black participants and ends with lower stroke rates among black participants. And there's quite a crossover with age. So there are lots of competing stories here about what might be happening. One possibility is that the processes of structural racism that lead to uh, racial inequalities in stroke among middle-aged adults are really no longer relevant in older ages. Another possible story is survival bias. And um, Elizabeth Rose's group just wrote out a simulation um, along that really fit the observed uh, data about the overall numbers for stroke incidents and put in pretty modest and plausible estimates for what uh, the processes of collider bias. And the pattern that you get on the, the bottom figure, the, the blue dots really show the simulated numbers. The simulated numbers under a collider bias scenario almost perfectly match the observed, observed data, really suggesting that it's a very um, appealing explanation for what might be happening. It's not that, that the race, the, the processes of inequality are really changing. That's a very important result for how we interpret um, a lack of observed inequality in older ages. Um, so moving back to uh, how we use more sort of conventional tools for, for causal discovery, the, the, the causal framework gives us three general categories of causal identification. If you're not looking at simulated data, but you're looking at data that already exists, um, you can put most, most of the, the approaches into one of these three buckets. The first bucket, which is dominant in observational epidemiology, is that we control for confounders. And sometimes that's called fulfilling the backdoor criterion. Um, and there are lots of technical tools to do this, and they have special names, but they, they all amount to um, measuring, modeling, and correcting for common prior causes of exposure and outcome. So propensity score methods, covariate control methods, and regression models, inverse, many applications of inverse probability weighting are about um, fulfilling the backdoor criterion. Um, a second approach is to measure all front door paths and add up the pathways. This approach is almost never used. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because I don't want George to get too worked up. Um, he's very deeply skeptical. Um, I'll just mention, I like to mention it because people should know that there's a method we almost never use. Um, and the third approach, which actually is very familiar to epidemiologists is, is based on using instrumental variables. An instrumental variable is a variable in our, in our DAG here, it's represented by Z, a variable Z that influences exposure and, but is unrelated to the potential outcome for Y setting X to any particular value. Randomized controlled trials are a special case of an instrumental variable. And, but we also see those in quasi experiments. You can think of regression, many regression discontinuity analyses and uh, related designs as, as leveraging instrumental variables. Now, it turns out that um, most of, a lot, a lot of the work in causal inference methods in the last uh, 40 years has been very focused on better modeling of backdoor paths, um, i.e. Con covariate control, control methods. And I think that the statistical tools that have been developed under that rubric, for example, tools to handle time-bearing confounding, um, tools to handle highly nonlinear um, uh, associations between confounders and, and either exposure or outcome. These tools are, are extremely important. I hope everybody appreciates my uh, very informal representation of nonlinear effects in a, in a DAG. That is not formal DAG terminology, formal DAG representation. Um, but we actually have developed really lovely tools to help address these kinds of problems. And um, those are very important and so have solved important problems. However, they can't really go beyond um, how, how the performance that we would have if we measure those confounders. They can't really solve the problem that we may at any given point have um, 
another confounder, even if we do perfectly at modeling you, there may be you too come that is there and uncorrelated with you and causing bias. Um, so all of these backdoor door methods really depend on similar untestable, um, unproof, unfalsifiable, sorry, not unfalsifiable, unprovable assumptions um, of no unmeasured confounding. So given this, I think it's really important to ask, can we learn more with other approaches? And I think with using the instrumental variable kind of approach, we actually could potentially learn a lot more. Um, there's a sort of disciplinary commitment to particular designs. And um, Ellie Maté, who just began uh, an assistant, as an assistant professor at NYU, wrote this really lovely paper sort of saying, look, we should do a better job at thinking about the trade-offs between um, different designs and how you choose different designs should be really driven by the specific setting and whether the assumptions are plausible in that setting and the limitations of previous work in, the, in an area. And I think that there's no point in doing more work with the same limitations as previous work. It's much more useful to do new work with, uh, even if it relies on, on strong assumptions that are new assumptions and different assumptions. And I think George and, and Debbie Lawler have made beautiful work on triangulation, articulating this idea very, very convincingly. Um, uh, so given that so much of observational epidemiology has relied on backdoor criterion approaches, there is potentially more to be learned if we can if we can leverage IV methods more aggressively. Um, I just want to make a note, and hopefully this is setting up for Miguel's talk here in a, in a little bit, that just because the strong assumptions are needed for causal inference, regardless of the method, it doesn't mean that we can give up on causal inference. We're here to improve health, so we have causal questions that we need to, to do our best to try to answer. Um, but I'm going to talk about some, some ways in which I think the causal inference framework, uh, and I, I think of these as sort of inspired by IV, can um, open up richer approaches than, than conventional covariate control, control methods. Um, the first is, is uh, sort of testable implications of a proposed causal structure to help understand the age when Alzheimer's disease first begins to emerge, and I'll show you some work we've done. The second is instrumental variables analyses of found or natural experiments. Um, this is a bow to, to Mendelian randomization, although what I'm going to show you are policy experiments. Um, and the uh, last is stuff that I haven't done, but I think we really should be as a field trying very hard to do much more of, which are low cost, light touch, randomized studies. Okay, so for the first one, testable implications of proposed causal structures. Um, for this, uh, this example is, is, is focused on, on understanding when does Alzheimer's disease begin. Alzheimer's disease and is, has historically been diagnosed as uh, when somebody has dementia as a cause of dementia, and that is typically occurring in people's late 70s. Um, but most people think that that diagnosis occurs after accumulating a um, development of pathology. But when does it actually begin? When does that pathology actually be begin is a pretty important question. If we're aiming to prevent, we would like to know the beginning of the disease. Uh, but it's hard, to, it's hard to identify because it's insidious and slow. So work, uh, this is work uh, led by Willa Brinowitz and uh, Scott Zimmerman and Peter Buto. And uh, the idea, Willa's idea was to take advantage of genetic risk score data, genetic risk scores that we know predict Alzheimer's disease, to try to understand at what age are we first experiencing, are we first seeing the manifestations of Alzheimer's disease. And the intuition here, the intuition is that if you're looking at people, um, you're looking at people for whom the, the preclinical dementia has not yet started, AD genetic risk shouldn't be influencing dementia yet, and therefore the genetic risk score should be in unrelated to cognitive change and cognitive outcomes. Whereas once you look in an age group where people have started to develop dementia, the AD genetic risk is influencing dementia and that's influencing cognitive function. So we can use the age when the genetic risk becomes associated with cognition to pinpoint when at, at an age at which there's clearly started to be some process of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so for these analyses, we use data from the UK Biobank. The big advantage of the UK Biobank is it's very large. So we could potentially get at, we could detect very subtle, subtle differences, which is what we want to do. We're not looking for when there's a big clinical manifestation. We're looking for when the very earliest point of, of divergence is. And this is an example with the simple digit substitution tests. And these are people with the 90th percentile of genetic risk versus the 10th percentile of genetic risk. And on the x-axis is the age 
And this is this model basically has searched across different ages within the within the sample to find the best fitting age of divergence of these lines for the people with high genetic risk versus low genetic risk. And the dotted line is when there's a statistically distinguishable um, line and the solid a statistically distinguishable difference. And the solid line is when there is a um, uh, that's the best fitting line of diver point of divergence. And what you can see is that that's happening by mid 50s, it's statistically significant and probably the divergence is happening before age 50, um, the very earliest evidence of divergence. And this picture, these are different outcomes. These, this picture looks pretty similar across multiple tests of cognition. So for example, verbal reasoning testing, pairs matching tests across um, neuroimaging measures. This is left hippocampal volume. Hippocampal volume is, is quite sensitive to um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it also shows up with um, body mass index. So body mass index, we know for a long time that people with Alzheimer's disease start to lose weight and that that happens early uh, for reasons that we don't fully understand. But what, what uh, Willow's work is showing here is that by age 50, we're seeing substantial um, divergences between people with uh, high genetic risk for Alzheimer's versus low genetic risk. Across all of the cognitive tests, we looked at lots of cognitive tests to see if there's a pattern, if there's certain, uh, uh, if it's if it's really consistent, or we were seeing a fluke. We did a lot of cross validation, of course, to try to avoid flukes. And what you see is that starting from age 40 here, moving on over, for many of these cognitive tests, by age 50, we are seeing age divergence. Uh, we're seeing divergence in cognitive scores between people with high genetic risk of Alzheimer's and low genetic risk of Alzheimer's really suggesting that, that there's an age when, um, that, that the beginning manifestations of Alzheimer's are happening um, uh, uh, long before late life. Okay, so that was that example of using causal thinking that is a little bit uh, beyond just covariate control to sort of say, this is, these are testable implications. Now I wanna talk about an example in which we were using um, instrumental variables analyses of found experiments or natural experiments. And in this example, uh, probably the most, at this point, the, the examples that people have seen the most of this type of study are using genetic instrumental variables. Um, I'm gonna talk about policy instrumental variables because I think for social inequalities, it's very, very relevant and the same uh, ideas and same challenges are, arise. Um, so here we're interested in saying, does educational attainment influence late life risk of dementia? So a challenge in answering that question is that cognitive test scores at any age we've measured predict late life dementia risk. And there's every reason to think that children with better cognitive test scores are likely to pursue more years of schooling on average. Obviously many other phenomena occur, but, but uh, that's uh, at least on average, cognitive test scores in childhood probably influence how long people go to school. So how do we disentangle whether extra schooling reduces dementia risk or children or whether it's that children who pursue more schooling would have had lower dementia risk regardless. So um, it turns out that there were legal changes throughout the United States and in fact globally um, during the 20th century and ongoing that led cohorts of children to complete additional schooling for reasons that were unrelated to their own social advantage, personal talents, or parental ambitions. Um, this little chart is just a picture for the state of South, um, South Carolina and running from about on the x-axis from about 1910 to about 1945. And on the y-axis is the number of years that the state of South Carolina said a child must attend school. And what you can see is that across the course of those uh, 40 years, 30 years, the state increased the mandatory schooling twice um, with pretty substantial increases. So if education is beneficial, um, and there is prior evidence that, that indicates these uh, these policy changes do in fact change how much schooling people complete. So if education is beneficial, did the children who receive extra schooling because of these policy changes have enduring cognitive benefits? Well, the answer to that is yes, it turns out. Uh, we, we published uh, now in, in a somewhat old paper, we published findings that in the United States, an extra year of schooling induced by this policy was, was associated with about 0.18 standard deviation better memory score. Um, subsequently, there have been many, many, I should say that study was, was really inspired by work by um, outstanding um, um, economists, including Josh Engrist and Adriana Garas-Muni, who've done incredible work on um, compulsory schooling laws and 
we took it into this realm of, of looking at cognitive outcomes because I was interested in dementia risk. Um, and subsequently, there have been many, many replications in many, many settings. And the overall meta-analysis suggests that uh, around each additional year of schooling is a, adding around 0.14 as standard deviation um, units uh, cognitive outcomes. That approach has been applied in many different settings. So policy changes occur frequently, um, some with somewhat arbitrary timing across places. Um, the same, and these same ideas are therefore now being used to evaluate the long-term effects of not just educational attainment, what I was showing before, but also things like educational quality, racially segregated schooling, college attendance, um, attendance at historically black colleges and universities, and to evaluate other, other um, health outcomes. These are examples of some of, uh, some of the work that's been done in this. I think Rita Hamad is doing some, some really innovative work uh, leveraging these ideas as well as, well as Anusha Vable. And um, on the right is a panel showing a systematic review that Rita did for different, many different outcomes and showing whether the associations, very hard to do meta-analyses of this work, but showing whether the associations are uh, generally show benefits of education or harms of education or no, no association. Um, and, and I would say right now, this work is still very active, but right now the evidence suggests that um, uh, education effects may vary across time, person, and setting, and they are not unambiguously health promoting. Although um, I would I would say for cognition, the evidence is pretty strong that it's beneficial. For other outcomes, there's more there's a more complicated story. But as soon as you look at this, you should be asking, uh, "Wait, Maria, I'm not sure that I believe these assumptions that you have to adopt for these models." So I think a natural question is to say, "Why rely on found experiments?" Looking for these natural experiments restricts us to specific policy changes that have already occurred and relies on strong controversial assumptions. Reasonable people disagree about the interpretation of results, eroding scientific consensus and trust. This seemed very salient. Um, this has been very salient during the pandemic. Conventional RCTs are slow and inflexible, um, but encouragement designs can be randomized and draw on the same ideas as instrumental variables, and they may be newly feasible with large passively accruing health, um, health data sources. So I want to be a little bit, uh, break down a little bit, like what exactly do we need for an IV model to work? Well, we just need three things. We need a source of random assignment. We need a first stage data source where we've measured the instrument and the exposure, and we haven't need an outcome data source where we've measured the instrument and the outcome. Those are the three pieces. Um, the, I think a couple of important insights have, have emerged in the, in the time since Angrist, Embens, and Rubin off, sort of repopularized a causal framework for, for IV methods. Um, and that part of that has come out of genetic IV and, and Mendelian randomization. But these are really powerful insights that change how, how important and how viable these studies are. The first is the insight that the first stage and outcome data sources do not need to be the same data source. And the second is that the IV can be valid and extremely informative, even if participation is low and wildly differential by determinants of the outcome. These, these insights really create huge opportunities to create experiments embedded within massive ongoing real world data accrual processes. So let's talk about an example, um, for example, and just to illustrate, I'm gonna take an example of, if you were interested in evaluating the effect of a medication that the FDA had approved, but was very expensive, and so most people would not be able to purchase it independently, how might you do that? Well, there, let's think about the randomization approaches first. We need three things, randomization data, first stage data, outcome data, what could we use for randomization? We could, of course, do a conventional RCT and randomize people to uh, uh, treat or not treat. That's arduous, slow, and a little bit cumbersome. We could also use passive randomization approaches where individuals or groups are, ra uh, are randomly assigned to encourage to receive to be or to be encouraged to receive treatment. This encouragement might include marketing or information supportive of treatment versus no such marketing, financial coverage versus no financial coverage for an expensive treatment. We could also use the treatment assignment to induce arbitrary thresholds for regression discontinuity designs. And finally, and I'm gonna mention this because it seems crazy, but it actually makes a lot of things more uh, viable. You can use treatment assignment based on any arbitrary, stable, recorded individual feature. So for example, whether somebody was born on an odd day or an even day of the month. 
for data sources, we could use um, lots of, of large, we need large data sources for this design, but routine surveillance data like Medicare or VA data, um, with, if the study is conducted within a large healthcare delivery organization, we could use EMR data. And these don't have to be the same sources for the two, the two uh, first stage and the outcome data, data sets. Um, but you know, things like Medicare would work for, for both. So just to be more specific about how this could actually go, um, uh, if we think about a specific example of a, of a study for evaluating an FDA approved medication, we would start by defining an eligible population, perhaps people diagnosed with, with mild cognitive impairment in uh, the first five months of 2022. We can specify any additional eligibility criteria. Random assignment would be based on whether you were born on an odd day of the month versus an even day of the month. Treatment could simply be that a provider sends a letter to eligible Medicare beneficiaries with diagnosed MCI who were born on odd days of the month and explain in the letter that if that there's a treatment available and if they pursue the treatment, the treatment would be the cost would be covered by Medicare. And for people born on even days, they would receive no such letter or they would receive a waitlist letter. The first stage data source could be Medicare, looking at the association between the birth date and uh, uh, um, whether treatment was received. The outcome, it would again be Medicare using the birth date and progression to, to dementia. The two stage least squares estimator intuitively is very simple in that the, the numerator is the effect of birth date on progression to dementia and the denominator is the effect of birth date on receipt of treatment. The power and precision of this approach really depends on the take-up rate. So the larger the sample and the bigger the take-up rate, the more the power, the more power we have. Oh, a key point here is if randomization is based on birth date, it doesn't matter what data set you use, it will almost always include information on birth date. So the person who does the randomization doesn't need to be directly connected to the person doing the out doing the analyses. They just need to say we use birth date in this way. In conclusion, uh, we really, this causal revolution is not done. We have yet to take full advantage of causal frameworks. Many of the most rigorous methods for causal inference were developed at a time before we had data needs, the data that we needed to, to use those tools effectively. Large passively accruing data sources that are now available radically increase the feasibility of low cost, light touch randomized designs. And my hope is that what the, the data revolution give us is an opportunity to learn faster, not via opaque statistics, but via rapid um, widespread randomized encouragement designs. The COVID pandemic could have been an incredible opportunity for light touch randomization, um, evaluating many, many, many policies that we did not know um, precisely what the effects were. Um, medication rollouts are a similar opportunity. Um, I think there are lots of challenges here in terms of understanding the ethics, the statistical modeling. However, the opportunity is, is very large. And I think most importantly, the, the most influential research will, will draw on causal frameworks, but also draw on contemporary theoretical debates and link those in very large data sources and try use those approaches to deliver more specific and useful public health guidance. I will end by thanking my amazing team and colleagues on both the Alzheimer's side and the COVID uh, side and National Institute on Aging uh, who supports us all. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much. Trying to get my thing on. Um, we perhaps, yes. One or two questions from uh, from the audience. So, um, Michael Holmes asks, how can, would such a trial, the trial re you referred to in the last part of your talk, be considered ethical given the drug has received a marketing authorization on the basis of empirically tested efficacy? You mentioned this, yes. Yeah, um, the, the key here is about encouragement. It's not actually about, it's about, providing people a resource that would influence their decision making about whether to pursue the drug. The, uh, the, I don't know if they'll, if Biogen, Biogen may change their policy as of yesterday, but right now they're charging $28,000 for the drug. Uh, Medicare decided not to uh, cover that unless people are participating in a randomized trial approved by FDA or funded by NIH. And so for most people that medication is not, is not within reach. Um, I personally think CMS's decision was brave and wise, 
but regardless, that's where we are right now. Um, they, the, the, so most people won't access the medication. Um, and so the, the encouragement I think has no, is, is acceptable. And that the, the key thing is to say to people, the financial, the financial costs would be covered. And here's the information on safety that you still need to make a decision about whether the evidence on efficacy outweighs the considerations about safety. Um, and I think that's what we saw, like the Bangladesh masking experiment was brilliant for that, right? They really had an encouragement design which, which helped circumvent issue, concerns about, about um, ethics. Thank you very much. Um, we come back most likely to a number of other questions. Uh, for example, new all front door pass measuring issues like that. Um, but uh, thank you very much now. And we, uh, we see you back at uh, uh, the general discussion, Maria. Um, that brings us to our final speaker of today, Dr. Miguel Hernan. Uh, Miguel is the Colocotronus professor um, at the Harvard School of Public Health. He um, is the director of the causal lab established, what is it now, about uh, half a year ago, um, and uh, one of the major contributors to causal interest thinking and writing. Dr. Hanan, please, make up your mind, you ask, is causal inference from observational data a legitimate scientific task? Thank you very much, Bert. Um, yes, uh, that is exactly the topic of my of my talk because here we are talking about causes and causal inference as if people outside of epidemiology believe that we are able to find causes and estimate causal effects but there are lots of people outside of our field that have very uh, very little confidence in what we do so um, there is really this question of whether causal inference from observational data is something that we should even try so let me talk about this. So of course, causal inference is important. We have heard uh, two excellent talks. I agree with essentially everything that, that was said there. And, and we, we as epidemiologists, we estimate causal effects to learn what works to improve health. And by doing that, we help people make better decisions. By people, I mean doctors and uh, um, and patients and policymakers and you and me. Uh, we, we have to know what works in order to make decisions based on evidence. And there is, a, there is a method in science to learn what works, to make causal inference, to estimate causal effects, which is a randomized experiment. We call it a randomized trial when it is in humans. The problem with randomized trials is that they cannot answer all the questions. They cannot answer many questions. In fact, think of questions like, do antidepressants given during pregnancy affect the risk of birth defects? That's a very important question, but we cannot conduct a randomized trial to answer that question. Or are COVID vaccines safe? Well, we can conduct a randomized trial of COVID vaccines, but not large enough to really learn uh, what, the, what the risk of adverse effects are. And if we go, outside of medical interventions, then there are lots of questions that we cannot answer with randomized trials about health. What are the long-term effects of air pollution, uh, good a change in our healthcare system to make, make it uh, freely accessible to everybody with lower child mortality for the next two generations. There, there are very important causal questions that we are not going to be able to answer with randomized trials. So, so we're left with two options. The first option is we stop asking causal questions that cannot be answered by randomized trials. And the second option is we try to answer those causal questions using data from observational studies, non-experimental data. And you know, each of these options have pros and cons. So let's talk about the first one. We say, look, valid causal inference only from Randomized trials. That means we don't we don't try to answer questions that cannot be um, 
that for which we cannot get answers from trials. So that means that this, that, it, that next time that someone asks us whether they should take medication during pregnancy or change their diet, we will say, we don't know. And there is a very big advantage of that, which is that we're never going to be wrong. There is a disadvantage though, is that we're not going to be very helpful for people who want to make decisions based on evidence. The second option is when we say, well, causal inference from observational data, that's a, that's a valid scientific task, is something that we're going to do. So when we cannot answer a question with a randomized trial, we will use observational data to emulate the target trial that we would like to have and provide an answer to that question. And the main advantage of, of taking this, this option is that we are going to help people make decisions. The main disadvantage is that we may be wrong. So maybe this is a good time to think a little bit about the evidence to support that causal inference from observational data is wrong. And in the interest of time, I'm going to focus only on relatively simple questions in which we have good measurement of the treatment and the outcome. So I'm not going to be talking about diet or about lifestyle. That's, that's the topic for a different talk. Let's, let me introduce you or to revisit with you three high profile examples of cases in which observational studies gave the wrong answer. These are very well known examples and we know that they gave the wrong answer because there was a randomized trial afterwards that uh, showed that the observational effect estimate was biased. One is hormone therapy and coronary heart disease. There were a number of observational studies that found that women taking hormone therapy uh, had a lower risk of coronary heart disease, about a 60% lower risk in some of the studies or even, or even more in others. The second example is studies and cancer. There are a number of observational studies that have found that um, individuals who use statins to lower their cholesterol have a lower risk of cancer. This has been proven to be wrong after meta-analysis of, of trials, same as the, as the hormone therapy example uh, was proven to be wrong after there was a large randomized trial. And, and the third example is the, the use of antiretroviral therapy in persons with HIV. <clears throat> there are there was also a prominent study that found that if you defer your initiation of therapy for just a few months, your risk of mortality almost doubles. So these are studies that are high profile because all three of them were published in the top medical journal. So these are very well-known studies, observational studies with results that are biased. So yes, Observational studies can be wrong. The question is, is this because the observational data are bad or because we're not doing the right thing with the observational data? If we go back to 1986 when James Robbins um, uh, published his general theory of causal inference from observational data, essentially seeing causal inference from, from observational data as an attempt to emulate the target trial. And he um, started to, develop the methods to adjust for confounding when, when we have uh, complex longitudinal data with time varying treatments and time varying confounders. So what happens if we take observational data and combine it with this theory, with this framework for causal inference, and then try to answer these high profile questions, these three high profile questions. So we actually did it. And it turns out that for hormone therapy, after we did it, we found no discrepancies between the observational studies and the randomized data. Uh, Barbara Dickerman led a study that this, did this also for the example of statins and, and cancer. And again, she found that there was no differences between the observational data and the randomized trial after using the right methods. And, uh, <clears throat> Also, Lauren Kane and Sarah Lodi, uh, they, they led studies to estimate the effect of different types of initiation of antiretroviral therapy in people with HIV. And they also found 
results that were compatible with those from the observational study. So some people might might think, well, but you are but you are cheating, right? Because you are analyzing the observational data after you know the answer from the trials, uh, and then you can modify what you're doing. That's actually true for the hormone therapy example and the statins example, but but it's not true for the um, anti-retroviral therapy example in which the, the, the study led by Sarah Lodi was the last observational studies published before the randomized trial findings were known. But there are many other examples in which observational studies using a, a, this modern causal inference framework have been published before the randomized trials were published. And in the interest of time, I'm going to give you just a few examples during, during the COVID period. So there was a study led by Shruti Gupta and David Leaf at the Brigham and Women's Hospital that estimated the effect of tocilizumab on mortality in critical care patients with COVID-19. And they found that the, that the drug was very effective something that was confirmed months later in a randomized trial. As part of the same team, Hani Al-Sankari led a study on the effects of anticoagulants and mortality in COVID patients. He found that there was no effect and that was confirmed by a trial data. Um, in the Veterans Administration, Kelly Cho was uh, led a study on the effectiveness of plasma therapy and survival in COVID patients found no effect, which was confirmed by trials later. So I will give you more examples, but the point is that option two is not as crazy as some people make it look. It's, there are many examples in which observational studies when done using a model causal inference framework and using high quality data, they're not very different from what, you, from what we get from the trial. So, so um, in, case, in case that someone was wondering, I am leaning towards option two here. Uh, but if you haven't made up your mind already, let's, let's talk a, a little bit more. Um, because you know this type of comparisons, these randomized trials versus observational studies comparisons, they kind of miss the point. Is causal inference is not a competition. This is not about whether randomized trials are better or observational studies are better or equally better. That, that, that's really not very helpful. Uh, the goal, like my colleagues have, have said before, the goal is to use the best available information in the best possible way. And so this is not about randomized trials versus observational studies. It's about randomized trials and observational studies working together to try to answer questions in the best possible way. We can use the randomized trials as benchmarks for the observational studies, and we can use the observational studies to extend the results from the trials or even to improve the design of future trials. And let me give you a couple of examples of how this works. Um, <clears throat> Lu Lucia, Petito and Xavier Garcia de Albenit, they led a study using observational data from Medicare in which they replicated the effects of cancer treatments in people with cancer. Um, and after doing that, after you can, using the, the trials that have already been conducted as a benchmark, to show that you can get there with the observational data, that now gives you more confidence to extend the results to things that could not be studied in the trials, like looking at and the representative groups. Similarly, my colleague Yuhan Chu did a, a very similar uh, thing, but with trials for infertility treatment. So you take trials for infertility treatment replicate them using observational data. And then after you have done that, you can, you can extend the results to things that could not be looked at in the trial. For example, to look at the estimates on maternal and neonatal 
complications that trials are not large enough to look at. A similar thing was done by Jennifer Eland, in which she also extended uh, the results from trials of infertility therapies to estimate potentially terato teratogenic effects of these of these therapies, all done after bench after benchmarking with the trial. And one other example of this that is very close to us now is COVID vaccines. Right, we have done uh, several studies of of vaccine effectiveness and safety in Israel, in England, in Spain, and in, the, and in the US. The first one was in February 21, when we used electronic health records from Israel to estimate the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine. That was the first time that, the, that this was um, published outside of randomized trials. And led by Noah Dagan, we estimated the effectiveness, but of course, that has been done by the trial before. Yes, but the trial had estimated the effectiveness for symptomatic infection. The trial didn't have the sample size large enough to look at serious outcomes with an unobtained a precise estimate, like hospitalization, say, and couldn't look at subgroups of people. We could look at subgroups by age, by comorbidities. We could look at the effectiveness during pregnancy, um, we could, uh, as a next step, study the safety of the vaccines led, led by, Noam, by Noam Barda and find adverse effects that, that trials are too small to find. So after we confirm, after we confirm effectiveness for serious outcomes in high-risk subgroups for the alpha variant, because the trial, the only trial, was conducted before there was alpha. So we had to do the observation of the studies to estimate the effectiveness of doing alpha because that is, what, that, that, is, that is what was relevant now for decision making. And of course, we evaluate the safety. Then the summer of 21 arrives and now there is Delta. And everything that we have done doesn't, is, is not valid because there is a new type of virus. And also, we don't know which type of vaccine works first. So um, led by Barbara Tickerman, we could estimate the effectiveness, the comparative effectiveness of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines using data from the Veterans Administration in the US. We found that both vaccines were very effective, but Pfizer was a little bit less, eff less effective. I think about this because after more than one year using these vaccines, when we have spent as a society billions of dollars, there are no randomized trials of comparative effectiveness of the vaccines. We don't know if we are paying more for something that works worse. Again, this is something that we are doing with observational studies. And we can do the same thing. Uh, this is a comparison of the, the Pfizer vac vaccine and, and the AstraZeneca vaccine in England led by, by Google by Will Hulme, and then we see that we have the Delta variant and the vaccine effectiveness is waning. So should we recommend a booster? And if we recommend a booster, to whom? I mean, think of August, 2021. There's a huge discussion about we should give boosters. And then there is a discussion about we should give boosters only to people over the age of 65 or to everyone. And there are meetings and the FDA and, CDC, and there are no randomized trials. Again, it's observational studies. What we do here, and so, so we find that, that the booster is effective, not only against, against infection, but against hospitalization in all age groups. And this and other studies like this are used to change policy. They are cited by, by Tony Fauci and by other people and say, we have to give boosters to everybody. And then we all, we, all, we, we all get boosted. And by the way, there is a randomized trial of booster. It was published five months later. It means it was published. It was available after Delta had disappeared. So we did a randomized trial, and when we had the results, we couldn't use it for policy because it 
it was relevant only for a variant that didn't exist anymore. We had to use observational data. Also, the trial, not, not only was late, it's a trial that has uh, 10,000 people. So you can look at the effectiveness for infection, but not for hospitalization and for the serious outcomes that we want to look at. Then Omicron comes. Of course, there are, there are no trials. Now we can, we can use data, in this case, from Spain, led by uh, Susana Monge, to estimate the effectiveness of the vaccines against Omicron. They are less effective, but they are still effective. And the next thing, we will have to look at the effectiveness of, of a second booster and effectiveness in children and safety. And, and, and then there will be a new vaccine because we, we will have a modification of the vaccine that works better for Omicron or for whatever the next variant is. And, and there will be a randomized trial for that per company. And then the whole cycle of observational studies will start again. So think about this. After the first phase three randomized trial for each mRNA vaccine, every single decision of a vaccine policy has been based on observational studies. And that means that it seems that we have effectively, for all practical purposes, we have made up our mind. We are using observational analysis to estimate causal effects and guide vaccination policy. So this option two is not as controversial as some people make it sound, that we can only trust causal inference from observational studies. We are trusting causal inference from observational studies and it's because there, can, there is no other way. It's the, only, it's the only way in which we can do this as a society make decisions. We cannot expect that we will have randomized trials whenever we need them, either because it takes very long to do it or because there are no financial incentives for doing it. Who is going to make a trial of the comparative effectiveness of Pfizer versus Moderna? So that's, that's what I was uh, starting to say before randomized trials and observational emulations of, of target trials, they're not competing strategies, they're complementary. Think of how it has worked for the COVID vaccine. First, we have, a, we have the phase three trials that kind of provide very precise information about, about the effectiveness of the vaccines and relatively little about safety and, and the effects in subgroups, but then we can do the observational studies to estimate all those things in a more precise way. But the interesting thing is that we can only do those observational studies well because we have a benchmark, because the randomizer had, had, had been conducted before. So we know that we are replicating that benchmark and now we can extend. And that is exactly the point is observational studies and randomized trials working together. And then we, we get the best of both approaches here. Okay, so let's say that we are willing to consider option two now, that we are going to use um, observational data to try to answer causal questions that we cannot answer with randomized trials. The question now is, um, what do we do to improve our observational studies? Well, there are a few things that we need. First, we need high quality data. Um, we need data for research, for surveillance, and for immediate use in a public health crisis. In the examples that I gave you for vaccination, we were using data from places where these databases exist, where you can use data uh, uh, quickly in Israel, in England, in Spain, and in the US within the VA. The paper that I show you uh, in the Omicron period from Spain, it was posted as a preprint in fe February 12th. On February 12th, it had data through February 6th, which means that we could do this almost in real time. And this is important uh, because places that are not taking this seriously in enough that they don't have health databases for the for the population of the 
country are not going to be able to respond as quickly. This is, this is really a matter of national security, having this in the European Union with the health data space, uh, they, are, they are starting to take it very seriously. So it will be good to see all countries doing that too. Besides high quality data, we also need good methods. Uh, we need to apply the target trial framework in an explicit way to eliminate biases. Because think about this. In the high profile observational failures that I mentioned, the reason why the observational studies failed was not lack of randomization. See, we have this obsession that observational studies are wrong because, there is, because the treatments are not randomly assigned. But in the very high profile examples, and I should show you three, but I could have um, discussed many, many more, the problem was not lack of randomization. The problem was that we were not using the data in the correct way. Once we did that, of course, we have to worry about lack of randomization. I'm not going to say that that is not a problem, that is a concern. There is no lack of, there is no randomized assignment. We can have confounding. But that concern can only come after we have used the data in the correct way to emulate a target trial, because there are other biases that are very common in observational studies due to a to important time in an other biases that are eliminated by using target trial framework, then we only have to worry about confounding. And confounding is a serious concern, but it only makes sense to think about lack of randomization when we uh, have the start of follow up in the right place. When we are comparing groups that are that um, that correspond to well-defined interventions, et cetera. So, Besides the high quality data and the use of a target trial framework, the other need, the other thing that we need is no editorial double standards. So let me let me tell you a story to explain what I mean. I show you three high profile failures. They were all published in the top medical journal, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I'm going to keep using this journal as an example, not because it is worse than the others, just because it is it is the top journal, so uh, it's fine to to uh, to say something about about you when you are at the top. But the funny thing is that none of these three observational reports were retracted ever. Um, but compared this with what happened with a randomized trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a trial on Mediterranean diet published in 2013. Four years later, the authors discovered that randomization had been incorrect in 20% of the participants. They have done cluster randomization rather than individual randomization things. Say that nothing very serious, but not what the protocol said. So they, they wrote to the editors and explained and, and also said, don't worry. If we exclude that 20% of the sample, results don't change. But this is always taken very seriously by the editors. They met with the authors, they worked with them for many months, and one year later, the paper was retracted and was replaced by a revised paper. Now, the effect estimates were the same in the retracted paper and in the revised but it was taken very seriously because it was a randomized trial. So this, this is what I call the double standard. We need to start treating observational studies seriously. If they're wrong, they have to be retracted, same as a, as a, as a randomized trial. Now, some journals make, make this very, very explicit. Take JAMA. JAMA is, a, is, is, a, is the most extreme case where, where authors cannot even mention the word causal effect in if they are submitting a, an observational study. In the two examples that, that I gave you before, the, the docilizumab example and the cancer example, both in YAMA group journals, you see that the titles don't, in, in, don't, in, don't include any causal language. The first one is association between docilizumab and mortality, and the second one is a 
convoluted way of saying that we are trying to estimate the effect of cancer treatments on overall survival, but we could not use causal language. That is, and that is a problem. That is a problem because if we don't know, if we cannot use causal language, we cannot explain what the causal goal is. We don't have a target. This is like shooting without a target, right? We are writing our paper, and the first thing that we should be able to say is we are trying to estimate the causal effect of tocilizumab on mortality. Because there are no trials, we are going to do it with observational data. And of course, there are problems, and, and this is how we are trying to deal with those problems. But if, if we cannot use causal ever, causal becomes the C word that we cannot mention, we can never explain which methods we are using. Imagine that we tell the editors, look, this is my observational study. And because you are telling me I can only use the word association, I'm giving you the association between vaccines and hospitalization. It's a two by two table, that's the association. The first thing that the editors will say is, no, 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 you have to adjust for compounding. And that's precisely the point. You have to adjust for compounding because you are trying to estimate the causal effect. By using this associational language, we just muddle the waters. It's not clear what we are trying to do. And therefore, anything that we do is not well justified because we are not explaining what the question is. If you explain what your target trial is, you know the question, and now you can justify the methods that you are using there. And the more that we talk about this, the better, because really it's time to make up our minds about observational studies for causal impacts. We either do these studies or not. We either publish, publish them or not. But if we do, then we need to avoid this pseudo-scientific ambiguity about causal impacts. We cannot retreat into associational language because first it is incongruent with our actions. We are using observational studies for causal inference. Second is intellectually lazy. And third is methodologically dangerous because if we don't know what our causal target is and we don't explain it, then the methods that we're using may be, I don't know, compare the exposed person time with the unexposed person time. Why not? It's an association. Right. So we need to, to make sure that the word causal is a word that we can say in public, that we can really explain I'm doing observational studies because I'm trying to estimate a causal effect. I'm not saying that I am succeeding at that. That's a different issue. Uh, I'm just asking for the possibility of explaining what we are trying to do. And some journals are, are starting to move in that direction, are much more transparent about the causal goals of observational size. Because really, the more we discuss it, the less dirty the C word sounds. If we start talking about it, we'll realize that there's a lot to be gained by doing that. Because, because observational studies, of course, are not our preferred choice. Other things equal, we prefer randomized trials. But we don't have randomized trials to answer all questions at all times. So it's really time to make up our minds and to clarify our language here. Um, thank you. Miguel, Dr. Adam, thank you very much. Um, I have, there are a few questions. Um, in, in the Q&A, but we will op open it up for a general discussion among um, um, and, and with the other panelists. But one question I would like to uh, you to address, Pedro Martins says, uh, to what extent could a target trial approach change the equipoise necessary to ethically allow uh, or not a randomized controlled trial? That is, that is an excellent question, because if we take the results from observational studies, seriously, it, it might change that. Um, take the example of tocilizumab. Tocilizumab, already in May of 2020, we have overwhelming observational evidence that it worked. But the trials were continued. They were giving not tocilizumab to hundreds of thousands of patients for six months. With, 
during the worst wave. So this is this is something that uh, we have thought about a lot. Uh, what is the meaning of taking these results seriously? Thank you. Yeah. Can I uh, ask you, Miguel, to unshare so that we see each other, and then um, we may um, have some other questions as well. And first, I would like to ask whether there are any comments, Dr. Glimmer, Maria, uh, or yes, there you are. And um, Dr. Davy Smith, George, yes. Any particular comments to each other? Maria. Those are great talks. Wonderful talks. Thank you. Thanks for uh, that. Was, it was a pleasure. I am curious, Miguel, if how your your assessment of um, observational versus randomized trials would be influenced when there is a large financial incentive. I think one of the challenges with observational studies is they leave more researcher degrees of freedom to, and and it, it may be one yeah. So I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Right, there, there is a, a, a strong financial incentive both ways, and we have to be um, careful about that. Um, uh, this, uh, in the last couple of months, we have seen, for example, how the drugs that are chosen to go into randomized trials tend to be drugs that are very expensive. Um, there is uh, overwhelming observational evidence that other drugs that are not very expensive uh, can be effective for the treatment of COVID, but they're not going into trials because no one is paying for those trials. So that, that, so that goes Good both. Point. That was both ways. But I think uh, to your point that observational studies, in, when you propose a protocol of a target trial, you are restricting the degrees of freedom a little bit because you have to explain what, uh, what the trial is and why you are doing that. And the, but the final solution really is going to be observational research with data that are widely shared. George, from your side. So, no, I, I enjoy both talks as well. And I very much I liked Maria's idea about um, you know encouragement designs and how those sort of things could could be built into you know very large scale data systems at very little cost. I mean, Miguel said um, you know there's not going to be more uh, vaccine uh, uh, trials. I mean, I I think. In, you know, in the UK situation, they should have randomized the booster types because you, you just got what happened to be at the place you went to. So, you know, and everyone would take what they were given. And um, um, I think, um, you know, there's not enough, there's no, the data from the trials don't tell you anything about, um, you know, um, uh, anything off, off target. And um, there's, there are plenty of data about both beneficial and negative um, uh, vaccine effects which aren't due to preventing um, infection you know there's some vaccine effects which you know suggest get more benefit than you should do through infection reduction uh, and it's you know it's possible that the different vaccine uh, types might have different might have different effects in that way so they should have just I think they should have tried um, you know to do to, to randomize um, to, to randomize boosters and different the types of vaccines to the extent they can and just carry on doing that. Yeah. My, my, my question to Miguel is, I mean, I think that, you know, in the situation with vaccines, at least if it was in the situation in the UK, there was rather little, um, you know, choice by the, the person, the receiver or by their healthcare provider. Um, it was, you know, it was about supply, et cetera. So I think in that situation, the observational studies, the, you know, observational designs, target trial designs will work well. I mean, I think uh, they, were, they work less well in, in situations where there's very strong confounding by indication. And uh, I mean, yes. um, one of Miguel's studies of uh, blood pressure, uh, you know, lowering suggested antihypertensives increased mortality. So I wondered if Miguel would like to, you know, talk about that issue about the differences of doing these studies in situations like with vaccines. Where I think the, I think the evidence he's, Miguel's produced has been extraordinarily helpful and useful and very convincing. 
but I, but I'm I'm less convinced of this application in situations like the antihypertensive um, situation where you know the wrong answer was produced. I think that one very important line of research uh, right now is or should be um, the 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 characterization of the settings in which observational data cannot work. And you just mentioned one. And uh, may, may, maybe there are there are some cases in which the confounding is, is so extreme, like use of anti-hypertensive so, uh, or use of statins when we're looking at the effect on- Miguel, may I interrupt you for a moment? And, and because this is a question that came up, Jessica Young, and I say I had myself as well. You, you said, well, I'm not going to talk about diet and, and lifestyle, um, uh, but if in the case of, of um, uh, observational studies, uh, selection bias and, and immortal time bias by design, study, proper study design has been removed, and we are just have to deal with confounding. Is there not particularly in those instances, it, very difficult to uh, to control for it like by the way in the case of confounding by indication that george just mentioned that's jessica's question yes that there are there are there are cases in which it will be impossible either because the confounding is extreme or because we don't have good data on the confounders and i think that it will be very important to have a more structured research uh, program that goes into that let me give you an example we, we we have studied the effect of screening colonoscopy on on the risk of colorectal cancer and the results that we get there using observational data from medicare are going to be i think they are correct we are going to know soon because the trials of colonoscopy are about to come out. So let's say that, that we are correct there. We, have, we are finding a benefit of screening colonoscopy on the, on the risk of um, colorectal cancer. But if we change the outcome, if rather than looking at risk of colorectal cancer, we look at risk of mortality, we get it completely wrong. And we know that we get it wrong because we get an effect, uh, quotes, an effect on mortality that is so extreme that it is inconsistent with everything that we know. We get more benefit than deaths from colorectal cancer exist, like one order of magnitude more. So, so clearly that is wrong. Why? Because we are using uh, claims and claims are not very good uh, data sources for many questions. They don't have uh, good data on confounders. And for colorectal cancer, there is not much confounding, but for mortality, there is huge confounding for things that, that we don't have in the claims. And so publishing these type of things, I think is very important. We should publish these failures and explain why we fail so that the next person doesn't do it. And the problem that we have, and this also has to do with journals, is very hard to publish these things. When we try to publish our, our biased estimate of colonoscopy on mortality, we went to several journals. Some of them I was an editor of. And they said, no, we are not going to publish that. That's bias. He said, yes, that's precisely the point. This is biased. We have to show that this is biased so others don't do it. Say, are you kidding me? No, we're not publishing that. So it was very hard to publish, but that, that's something that we need to do more, I think. Let me, let me give you one more question, comment from, uh, from the Q&A. This is Dr. Tyler Vennevele. He is convinced already of option two, uh, like probably most of us. However, for a skeptic, with the evidence presented, how would you respond to the, someone who said, of course, you can find cases in which observational studies prospectively get similar answer to subsequent RCTs. Roughly half the time they will be right by chance and half the time they will be wrong by chance. You're just selecting the success cases. You must have heard this question before, Miguel, but... Fair enough. I'm going to respond with, with a challenge and maybe something that can come out of this, of this, uh, of this symposium. It's, could you please let us know cases in which observational studies are wrong? Yes, which are the cases in which observational studies are wrong? Are there many of those examples? Are there uh, 
and and then we will we will classify them in those who are using data that obviously should not have been used. You are trying to estimate the effect of statins, and you have the, you don't have data on LDL cholesterol, and those in which the methods are, are not are, are not well used, and then we'll see how many are we are left with in which the data are good, the methods are good, but really there's so much component that, that we cannot do that. And I think I see this as a research project is let's let's find the cases in which observational studies have given the wrong answer because uh, the ones that we have looked at, maybe we have been very lucky and we've chosen the ones that could be fixed, but um, we love to find more. George, so yeah, so, you can find more from precisely the data sets you've used, Miguel. Uh, I mean, you know, the examples which uh, had large effects, uh, you know, were, were um, you know, influenced things were the vitamin E supplement papers, the two back-to-back -back papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, where the observational uh, exposure was taking vitamin E supplements for two to five years. And that showed, you know, 40% lower coronary heart disease risk. It was the front page of the New England of the New York Times main headline: use of vitamin E supplements, either singularly or in combination, went up to 40 odd percent of the UK of the US adult population. So it's consequential work, and those data are available. It's never been can be reanalyzed uh, and um, looked at. And there's other studies from the same source which looked at supplements. And, so uh, maybe. Maybe now maybe George, we have we have we still one minute, otherwise we are cut off. So okay. that means that I give 20 seconds for the last word to Maria Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, sorry. To I, I, I'm going to basically endorse what Miguel said. Like the, the idea, like there's so many things we're not going to be able to randomize. Even I mean, I really think we underuse encouragement designs. I think we could be randomizing a lot more. And I think that we as a field should be pushing to randomize more and think about encouragement designs that have light touch. But at the end of the day, there are lots and lots of exposures we're not going to be able to randomize. And being able to publish bias, quantify bias, and actually benchmark against randomized studies to figure out when we're getting when we're getting it right in the observational studies and then extend is exactly the approach we have to use. So Maria Glamour, George Davy Smith, Miguel Hernan, thank you very, very much. It was most enjoyable to have you and uh, illustrative as well as informative. Thank you very much. Coppelia, Coppelia and Haley, thank you very much for organizing this all. Um, we'll put on now a final slide and uh, I wish you all a very good weekend and George, you can now go to the pub as you wanted to do before. Thank you. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.